Thank you and welcome uh, everyone. I want to start off by thank you for joining this session and I want to thank the Linux Foundation for uh, inviting us to talk about some of the latest research that Palo Alto Networks has done um, on not just uh, the expansion of cloud adoption, but also how it's impacted cloud security during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I am Jason. I work with the product marketing team at Palo Alto Networks, focused primarily on cloud native security. Um, and here with me, I have Nathaniel. Nathaniel, you want to introduce yourself? Well, certainly. Thank you. Hi, I'm Nathaniel. Um, I'm a uh, principal researcher with Unit 42 uh, within Palo Alto Networks. Um, the picture is no longer me anymore. The beard's gone. Sorry, everybody. But uh, I just want to say thank you for uh, being part of the Linux Foundation. Linux is an amazing operating system. Um, I've been near and dear to my heart for several, several years. So happy to be here. Awesome. So today's agenda is we're going to cover some cloud adoption trends. And then also highlight how those cloud adoption trends have impacted uh, the cloud security posture, uh, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. Once we identify those two key things, we're gonna talk about what has worked for some organizations, what did not work, especially for those uh, organizations who rapidly expanded their cloud adoption. Then we're gonna close out with some key takeaways and recommendations when it comes to your cloud native journey. But before getting started with some of the content, let's actually cover what kind of research are we even talking about? There's actually two uh, research pieces that Palo Alto Networks has done. Um, the first I will cover, which is our state of cloud native security. Um, the 2022 edition as part of Prisma Cloud's annual survey uh, covers the dates of you know, uh, June 2020 to uh, June 2021, those 12 months span, and we cover just some um, practices and technologies that companies use to manage cloud native security. When we do this research, we survey 3,000 professionals. They could be cloud architects, DevOps leads, people on the InfoSec team, and they span across globally. And we're not really focusing on any particular vertical. Uh, we've taken research from companies of all sizes and verticals. Um, I'm going to hand it off to Nathaniel to talk about some of the research that he's actually worked very closely with. Yeah, cool. Uh, within Unit 42, um, we do a cloud threat report and we do this biannually. Um, so we'll do one in the uh, first half of the year. So this is a report that we're going to be co covering specifically in this uh, webinar is specifically up to the first half of 2021. Uh, and what we specifically looked at in here is we looked at real data from real environments. Um, uh, and we looked at their impact specifically pre-COVID and then post in this aspect, uh, the Delta variant wave uh, of, of COVID-19. And we wanted to look at uh, the correlations between uh, cloud growth and then security trends that may or may not be correlative uh, with those growth, with that growth and that impact. Um, it was a great report. Uh, we'll give you links at the end of this webinar for both of these reports. Yeah, awesome stuff, Nathaniel, and thanks for reminding me. At the end of this webinar, we'll actually uh, provide you with QR codes as well as links so you can get access to these reports. Uh, but before doing that, let's actually dive in and talk about some of the highlights of these reports, beginning with cloud adoption trends during the pandemic. Um, one of the things that we noticed at Palo Alto Networks was that, uh, you know, based on the, the research over that 12 month period, um, like cloud is actually shifting to become the dominant compute model. Why is that? Well, for starters, there's 3,000 experts that we surveyed. On average, uh, in 2020, they were hosting less than half of their workloads in the cloud. And they actually shifted to the majority of workloads running in cloud, uh, a rise up to 59% of their workloads. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that every organization we talk to is hosting majority of their workloads in the cloud. So we also took that into consideration and found that um, of the, the companies we talked to, 69% of those experts said that they're hosting a majority of their workloads in the cloud, um, which is, you know, before it was less than a third of those organizations were hosting uh, more than half of the workloads in the cloud. Um, but globally speaking, we found that there was a 25% increase in cloud workload adoption year over year. So we're seeing that a lot of organizations have found a lot of strategic benefit out of the cloud 
Um, and in fact, they're taking on new approaches uh, to their cloud native application development, and as well as new types of workload architectures. You know, in a data center, we rely on bare metal and virtual machines. Uh, sometimes we talk about containers in a you know, private data center, but as we span into the cloud, um, you can see that organizations are taking on new types of compute architecture. So they still have some VMs, uh, containers are rapidly expanding. They're also adopting containers as a service as well as PaaS and serverless functions. One of the most interesting points that we found was that there was a, a massive increase in the adoption of PaaS and serverless functions, meaning that this probably helped organizations build and deploy applications faster when we found this. And one of the reasons you see that, that expansion of you know, containers of service and passers and serverless functions uh, is because you know, majority of the drivers to the cloud was because they want to modernize applications. They want to you know, expand them into microservices, independent services, probably adopt uh, DevOps as, as part of their, um, their, their cloud strategy. They also want to maintain competitiveness in the market and a little over half of the organization said they just simply want to reduce that infrastructure overhead. Now, there are some other reasons um, that you'll see sort of faded here, such as maintaining compliance and some were just already born in the cloud. So with that said, uh, Nathaniel, I think you have some information to share on these cloud adoption trends and how they really correlate to security outcomes. Yeah, most certainly. Um, so as we were just kind of touching base there with um, what are the types of services that we see being adopted within the cloud? Um, in this next slide here, we're going to see that uh, we looked within the report itself, within our uh, uh, cloud threat report, is we looked at two basic models. We wanted to see how much money was being spent in cloud, and then we wanted to uh, do that correlative capabilities with uh, how many security incidents we are finding within cloud workloads uh, as we're moving. So uh, there's a couple lines here. Uh, the blue line is going to be our security incidents that we found within cloud, in, uh, cloud environments. And the green line uh, is going to be the cloud growth rate or how much money has been spent in cloud industry. And this is all uh, per Synergy data uh, resources that we, we grabbed at the time. Our data started back uh, around October-ish timeframe of uh, 2019, uh, and then went through the again the October-ish timeframe of 2020. So this is the the synergy data that that we found from this. So um, you know around the December timeframe, uh, obviously uh, you know COVID was announced. WHO said that uh, there was a mysterious new coronavirus that was out there, um, and then within you know January, February, March, um, you know skids hit, right? Everybody stopped working. Uh, um, you know, people were like, are, are we gonna, you know, is this a major pandemic? We know what's gonna happen. We saw this uh, reflect within cloud spending. So the green line on the bottom, it was above 30%. We are about 34% in that range. Uh, and then we dropped just below 30% to about 29% right around in that first quarter of 2020. Correlatively, we saw that the number of security incidences or number of workloads that were being created with uh, misconfigured uh, cloud infrastructure also had a dramatic drop as well. People were not deploying in cloud environments. Then we started seeing an uptake uh, because people were starting to realize we need to get this economy going again. Uh, we got to get people back to work. How are we going to do that? We need to put them online because of, uh, you know, um, you know, number of reasons you can't be in offices and close quarters anymore. So everything kind of went online. Then we saw cloud spending still going down, but now security incidents started rising or systems that were created with security misconfigurations. It dropped down to about 43% and now it dropped above about 51% that very next quarter. So a pretty significant uh, increase. And then it was kind of on a steady uh, increase. And then eventually people were like, we need to support cloud. And then we started bringing up the cloud. Um, so it kind of a very interesting uh, correlative capability that we, that we were looking at there. If we go to the next slide, um, we wanted to look at the types of industries specifically that we saw the biggest majority of growth in cloud workloads. Um, across the global average, there was about a 25% increase uh, pre-COVID to post-Delta uh, variant. Um, and there's five industries uh, that we saw the most growth in, at least the top five here. Um, 
it shouldn't be surprising that manufacturing, in this case, chemical manufacturing and government saw the highest amount of uh, cloud workload development or growth, about 83%, followed closely with pharma, um, obviously pharmaceuticals being very important during a, uh, during a pandemic, uh, also wholesale and insurance also rising. Um, interesting correlative numbers, uh, or at least uh, statistics in that particular aspect. Wholesale uh, being like, who's going to actually you know, go buy things? Then we wanted to look at, okay, so now these uh, organizations, all these industries are, are going to the cloud. What is inside of those cloud workloads themselves? What we found was kind of surprising was that 64% of the data that we were able to see within all of the industries, all of the uh, organizations that we have uh, visibility uh, into, we found that 64% of those organizations maintain some sort of sensitive information. If we break that sensitive information down into two pieces, we found that 69% of that data was primarily PII data. So your person name, uh, birthdays, social security numbers, things of that nature. We also found that of that 64%, 34% of that data was intellectual property, like actual source code information, infrastructure as code templates, um, you know, information that would be sensitive uh, to the actual running you know, fundamental operation productivity of organizations that they're operating. So there's not just no, nothing in there. I mean, it, it, it's significant types of information uh, that, were, that were in there. So uh, doing the security correlation to it, um, we know that there's sensitive information up there. Um, what were those industries that had the highest rate of security incidences or security misconfigurations uh, within their new cloud workloads that they were creating. And again, this is pre-COVID and then post-Delta variant that we took this information. We found that retail industry had the largest amount of security misconfigurations within their cloud workloads, and that grew by 402%. Um, and again, when you think about retail coming online, new systems coming up have to scale dynamically and rapidly uh, to make these new systems you know, meet demand. Um, and in, in that creation of those new systems, uh, they, just, they just put one instance of a misconfiguration and it just spread like wildfire through the rest of that population uh, of that, uh, say, infrastructure as code release. We also saw that directly, if we can go back just this slide, we also saw that direct uh, correlation with uh, manufacturing, government, and pharma and life sciences. If we recall in the previous slide, they had uh, roughly 83 and 81. Uh, percent growth in cloud workloads during that time. They also had a 230% increase in the number of security incidences uh, and then 205% in, in, in government. Interesting, if you go all the way down to the bottom, look at wholesale, which is a, a, a kind of a big contrast between retail and, and wholesale, even though they're kind of almost in the same, same family. Um, wholesale grew by you know, roughly 73% uh, in total cloud workloads, but they only saw a total of 17% increase uh, in the number of security misconfigurations during that time. And we kind of make a surmise uh, within our report as to why that may be. Um, wholesale is not foreign to cloud infrastructure or cloud workloads. Um, they're already there, they've already been present, they've already doing all their infrastructure. So the ability to scale dramatically and maintain security on top of that didn't seem to be such a big issue where something like government or manufacturing may not have had that, uh, that, that cloud uh, workload knowledge or security uh, bandwidth to begin with. So some interesting insights uh, coming through that. All right, next slide. So also within the uh, uh, cloud threat report, we wanted to take a look at uh, who is a targeting or attacking uh, specific cloud infrastructure and cloud environments. Um, one of the biggest offenders of uh, cloud incident uh, compromise is due to cryptocurrency, uh, crypto mining, um, namely like Monero or Ethereum mining. Um, big craze, and why is that? So we took a, a look into the correlative uh, relationship between um, market price, which is the yellow line here, this is a Bitcoin market price, uh, and then the number of uh, instances or uh, configurations we saw within cloud environments connecting to uh, mi like mining pools in that environment. Um, so interesting insight. If you're interested in that, please go check out the report. This side specifically is very interesting to look at because we see a couple spikes here. On the far left here in 2018, 
um, we see both Google searches, which is the blue line, and then the market price, which is the yellow line, and they both like peak really, really high. This is that fear of missing out trend that you may hear of it within um, market trends or, or you know, Wall Street's not uh, not susceptible, you know, not unsusceptible to this sort of um, motivation. Google trends go up, interest goes up, price goes up, and then it drops down pretty significantly. And then you see the market price going up as the Google searches kind of stay the same when uh, the WHO declared the pandemic drop again in that price. So a very interesting chart, something that we were looking at as to what would be the targeting factor of a lot of cloud organizations. And this is kind of a neat slide that kind of puts that all together. It's pretty cool stuff. Awesome. So um, next we're gonna cover what worked and what did not work for some of those uh, organizations who expanded their cloud investments. I actually just want to take a pause really quick and remind everyone, if you see anything uh, that captured your interest, do not hesitate to go ahead and put it in the chat or in the Q&A, and we'll definitely address that uh, during the Q&A session. Um, so moving back into the content here, we'll cover what worked and what didn't work. So we took um, three different categories and sort of took the organization and put them into these, these buckets. Um, starting on the far left side, we called moderate adopters. These were organizations who had sort of a, a steady cloud expansion, not a very high priority for the cloud. Uh, they were like semi invested in the cloud. In the middle, we have rapid expanders. Uh, these are uh, organizations who saw a lot of strategic and tactical value in the cloud and therefore just uh, really bolstered their way through uh, in, into the cloud and rapidly expanded and adopted and probably took on some new and unique approaches. And then finally, we have established users. We see these as uh, they're, al they're already kind of like in the cloud. They're heavily invested. Uh, sometimes they're just already born in the cl cloud. Um, but while the cloud is a higher priority, they probably didn't really expand too much because they're already in there. When we talk about the expansion and what worked, what didn't work, we're gonna focus on one of these three buckets. And if you wanted to guess, it's the middle one. We're gonna talk about rapid expanders and what worked and what did not work for them. And when we talk about this research, there's actually kind of uh, two sort of things that we saw with these adopters. Um, in the rapid expander, we found some were uh, quite successful, meaning they, they expanded their workloads and they want to take on more in the future. Whereas there were some others who tried to rapidly expand and it didn't work out so well. They actually found it kind of challenging. Um, sometimes they saw it as a loss for them and said, we're actually going to not add more workloads or decrease our, our workload count in the cloud. Um, the division of that is 74% of the rapid expanders were considered successful. And then the remaining 26% were the ones who uh, found it kind of challenging to expand. And the ones who uh, found it challenging declared that over the next two years, on average, uh, they're probably going to either you know, decrease or maintain uh, their, their cloud adoption by 26%. And then the rapid expanders said, no, we want to keep pushing more. This is really working out for us. So um, it's, a, it's a pretty fair split, but what in the heck happened? Well, sorry, it's not moving forward. There's actually about four or five reasons uh, maybe why this happened. And we kind of broke that information down in this report. Uh, one is that the, they had different types of strategies, the way they approached the cloud. They some uh, maintained a lot of different tools, uh, including security tools when expanding in the cloud. The, the challengers are the ones who found it challenging. Uh, it turned out they had six or more different vendors and tools that they were using to manage their cloud and cloud security. Whereas if you look at the right side, you'll see that a lot of teams found uh, they said we want to simplify things. We want to consolidate our tools and vendors that we run in the cloud. So majority on the right, right side actually ran anywhere between one to like five vendors or fewer in the cloud. A pretty interesting take there. Another thing we found was the focus on automating processes and tasks. If you look at the uh, rapid expanding challenging adoption side on the left side uh, of those two bars, you'll notice that um, about 88% in total 
had low to moderate automation, not very invested in automating tasks in the cloud. Whereas the very successful rapid adopters so they were going to actually go all in or, or invest heavily into automation. So sort, of, sort of an inflection between these two. Um, and I can just look at Nathaniel and just tell that um, he has he has picked up on a pattern. There's something he wants to say about it. Nathaniel, why don't you go and tell us about these two trends here? Yeah, most certainly. Um, so if we if we go back and we look at um, what makes security successful in environments, um, it is simplicity for. First and foremost, if we can make something simple and easily understandable and automated in the same time, um, we will increase the security capability of that organization. If we get rid of all the number of vendors and we kind of go to that single pane of glass sort of look, um, it is easier to manage, it's easier to maintain, and it's an easier to maintain uh, oversight over that uh, uh, infrastructure that you have developed. And if you're able to take and harness the power of cloud, which is fast and dynamic, if we can automate that and not just simply automate it, but highly automate it, then we will dramatically increase um, our security. So this quote was, was very interesting, something that we've been looking at within uh, my team specifically, is that if we don't have automation, the sudden increases in cloud workloads, that dynamic scalability, that horizontal push to, to meet demand um, will lead to dramatic increases in security incidents. And why is that specifically? It's because of that infrastructure as code template, those serverless configurations. If those things are insecure to begin with and they have to radically or dramatically expand in order to meet demand, that one vulnerability or that one misconfiguration will be populated thousands of times along the lifespan in order to meet that demand. So it makes just security completely overwhelming for organizations. Within our report specifically, we looked at what are the, the top uh, you know, security misconfigurations that we see within environments? And this is actually pretty interesting. It's actually, there's two misconfigurations in here and one, uh, you know, gotta watch out, scary moment. Um, so on the, on the left here, the number one security misconfiguration that we found within cloud environments is that they failed to encrypt SQL databases. Um, may sound simple just in word terminology, but we have to think about what is inside of those SQL databases. If we think back to those previous slides that we saw, 64% of organizations had some sort of sensitive information inside of their cloud workloads. And of that 69% or 64%, 69 was PII and 34% was intellectual property that's stored inside of databases. So if they're unencrypted, an attacker is able to get into that cloud environment um, and it's not encrypted. It's just kind of like, the, here's the keys, just go take whatever you can find inside of it. So encrypting SQL databases uh, is, is very, very important for us. And it's a really easy lift. Uh, cloud service providers, whatever one you're using, or if you're using multiple cloud service providers, um, give you encryption for free. Might as well just take advantage of that. The middle column here is kind of the scary gotcha. Um, is that when we saw the, the correlative capability of cloud workloads uh, growing, um, attackers also saw that. And we saw 185% increase in the number of malicious port scans directed towards cloud environments during that same period of time, pre-COVID to uh, post-Delta variant. Um, so attackers are seeing this. And they're like, oh, something's got to be open. Something has to be misconfigured. So they're looking for it. And then they're also looking for uh, those unencrypted files, uh, things like this, the, the last point, 149% uh, of organizations uh, saw an increase in uh, unencrypted database snapshots. These are things that haven't turned on yet, that may be ready to turn on to meet demand. Um, and if they're not encrypted at rest or in that, during that snapshot, again, they're just vulnerable for attackers to take those. Awesome, yeah, thanks for those insights, Nathaniel. So uh, just a few more reasons that there were some different, or what a few more differences we found between those different types of uh, rapid expanders was the amount of you know effort they put into reducing team friction. Uh, we found that the less successful half of them actually had a lot of friction. Um, and when we say friction, what do we mean specifically? Well, as we've highlighted earlier in the slides, cloud adoption has expanded, and one of the reasons for that expansion is. Um, 
you know, application modernization, becoming highly developer focused, incorporating DevOps into cloud infrastructure and cloud workload deployments. Uh, those teams want to move really fast. Now on the flip side, the security team says, we want to make sure this is really secure. And when the two teams uh, work in the cloud together, if security is not automated and aligned to the way that developers and DevOps teams work, it creates a lot of friction. So those who paid attention and actually focused on reducing that friction between security and Dev and DevOps, they actually found a lot of success. In fact, you know, we see 67% of them reported low friction within their organization as successful cloud expansions. This goes hand in hand with the previous point. I mean, uh, part of lowering the friction is incorporating DevSecOps principles, shifting security left. What does that mean? Well, uh, we're talking about shifting security left in the software development life cycle. As your application developers uh, code up their applications and configurations, they uh, build it and deploy it with CICD processes, CICD pipelines. Um, and then, you know, you run it or run it and move it to production. Uh, that kind of, you know, creates the circle of the, the application lifecycle or the software development lifecycle. Um, most of the time, security actually typically runs at runtime. We say, okay, it's in production, let's secure it. But by shifting it further left in that software development lifecycle, saying anytime we build, um, you know, applications or we start to deploy, let's actually integrate into CI CD pipelines. Uh, and run cybersecurity checks there. Now, bringing it back to the research, now the organizations who had low DevSecOps, uh, which we found that you know 49% of the uh, challenging adopters uh, really found that uh, nearly majority of them had low DevSecOps principles incorporated into their security. Whereas actually the flip side majority uh, said, no, we're going all in on DevSecOps. And they had uh, very high sophisticated DevSecOps practices across our application development life cycle. That's one thing that led to success during the cloud adoption. And finally, um, the organizations who are most successful built, had a strategy, and they had a lot of reasons to move to the cloud. If you look on the far right side, you can see that they were very confident in that we, our strategy is to modernize our cloud applications, maintain competitiveness, um, be part of a wider digital transformation, Whereas on the left side of this graphic here, um, we're seeing that they kind of shied away from reasons. Yes, there was here and there some application modernization, um, reduce you know, infrastructure overhead, uh, but they, they kind of shied away a little bit and just kind of said, we're gonna move to the cloud just because you know, we're supposed to do that. Um, so you know, taking, have a strategy and you know, purpose behind moving to the cloud uh, is one way to ensure success. So just to kind of recap on all these things, um, you know, rapidly expanding to the cloud, you know, top four things to think about is simplify, consolidate your tool sets and vendor sets, uh, incorporate automation, everything you do, including security, by incorporating DevSecOps and shifting left. And of course, having a strategy behind your cloud migration, your expansion, uh, these are ways you can focus and ensure a more successful efforts in your cloud expansion. So what can we learn from these findings here? So some key takeaways I'd like to highlight is that uh, in our state of cloud native security research, organizations we spoke to, uh, we found out that those who had, um, you know, DevSecOps incorporated into their cloud native security said that they were seven times more likely to have a strong or very strong security posture. And then they were also nine times more likely to have low levels of security friction. Remember, reducing that friction between security and DevOps. Another kind of interesting takeaway um, is sort of the, you know, the correlation uh, between like, you know, a very strong uh, security posture as well as low friction. Um, if you have sort of low levels of uh, uh, sorry, if you have like low levels of security friction or low levels of uh, automation, um, we see that there is a, you know, less likely to have low security friction or also less likely to have a strong security posture. 
Uh, but as we shift more to the right side of the screen, as we progress to the right, you notice as we increase the level of automation within the cloud, uh, not just cloud tools and de deployment, but also cloud security automation, uh, we found out that they were able to, you know, very likely to increase both their security posture as well as lower that security friction. So something kind of interesting there to take away. We also found that as security postures became stronger, um, you know, that could be an effort of uh, stronger automation, uh, there, it actually came out with better business outcomes. We see a, you know, a, a surge in increased productivity as well as satisfaction across organizations who are end users of the cloud. So just to sort of wrap up here, um, you know, what we just highlighted last few slides that if you increase, you know, your security, your automation and reduce friction, it can actually lead to better business outcomes, um, more satisfied application development and DevOps teams. Uh, Nathaniel, what kind of takeaways do you have from this research? Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, there's a lot of really good takeaways that came from this, uh, doing that integration, getting getting your DevOps in sync with your security teams is, is critical. We find that too, uh, within the digital transformation strategy, if you are looking at uh, your security posture for your cloud environment, um, and if you don't have a specific strategy on how you want to create that cloud platform from the very beginning with a security component in mind, then it's going to be very, very difficult to maintain that security posture. So make sure that you have a strategy that how are you going to transform from an on-prem environment into that cloud environment? How are you going to bring your dev environment team and your security environment team together to create that cloud platform? You can make that security, you make that strategy more cohesive. It's going to have a lot more success. Um, you're also going to automate more. So this is the point number two. If you can cr create that automation, highly automate your DevOps, and you can highly automate your security into that DevOps, you create that DevSecOps uh, principle. Very key to creating a successful cloud environment. And as I mentioned earlier, that simplification. How can we simplify uh, the usage of cloud by making it more uh, integrated, more automated, um, and making those relationships of, the, of DevSec or DevOps and security teams together, how can we simplify that relationship to make uh, the tool sets more efficient? Um, is, they're all key, key aspects. Um, I wanted to go over like the five pillars uh, or ba basic uh, levels that we have or that we think creates a cloud security excellent framework. Um, so starting with that base foundation, what we're looking for is we want to ensure that we gain visibility into our cloud environment itself, see what's out there, make sure we know and document that information. Once we have that, we can create and set up guardrails. We can say what should happen, what should not happen, what users could access this, what users shouldn't access this. Set up those guardrails to make sure that you can see uh, and, and are notified and alerted when something is you know, running amiss. And we want to set up some sort of standard. I uh, want to adopt a standard. There are a number of standards that you can follow. Uh, one that we typically try to push uh, pretty heavily, it's an open source standard. It's from the uh, Center of Internet Security. They have a lot of cloud benchmarks, be that whatever cloud platform you're using, you know, AWS, GCP, or Google, or, uh, or Azure, um, and, and others as well, IBM, Oracle, uh, et cetera. Um, make sure that you're adopting a standard that makes sense for you. We also want to ensure that your security engineers, the people who are managing and operating the security tools that are monitoring your cloud environment, they know how to code. They don't know how to code, ensure that you're training them how to code. Because of this highly automated capability and push that cloud is, is making in our environments, uh, being able to have your security team code effectively uh, is, is a surefire win that you'll be able to do something very, very successful. And that pinnacle that piece on the top is if we can satisfy that visibility, set those guardrails, have that uh, those standards that we're upholding ourselves to, and we have engineers who are capable of operating at a highly uh, automated, highly uh, dynamic sort of fashion, we can ensure that that all influences the DevOps, the creation process of our clouds to make sure that our cloud is as secure as it can be from as early as it can be that shift left mentality. Um, they all work together to create that, uh, that excellence in security. 
So kind of with that, we're going to move into the, the, the Q&A portion. Um, yeah, there's one question that came through uh, uh, already that I want to touch base on right away because we, we touched it earlier and it's near and dear to my heart. <laughs> so I want to hit it first. Um, uh, did you observe a COVID impact on cryptocurrency in any recognizable way? Um, we did. So if we direct yourselves to uh, the blog itself, which will give you the links to that, should we hand up those links? Just next slide. Cool, um, use a QR code, just use your phone or uh, go to these particular links. Um, and you'll see on the right, the right uh, column there, which is their cloud threat report. If you go to page 11 and page 12 uh, within that, um, we do have some interesting trends when it comes to market prices of specifically Monero, which we consider kind of a criminal coin um, because it's just used so heavily within uh, um, you know, the crypto mining uh, operations. Not that it's a bad coin uh, or, or poorly secured or anything like that. It's just uh, it's used pretty uh, by, by criminals more often. Um, we do find specific trends um, within uh, how the pandemic impacted mining operations. The, surprisingly enough, the biggest trend that we saw was that um, attackers took the holidays off. They actually didn't do a whole lot during December 24th through uh, January 3rd of, of 2020 to January 3rd, 2021. Um, we did find that uh, when the when there, there were events, uh, specifically in Brazil, when Brazil had their first uh, um, Delta variant um, push, um, there was a major decrease in the number of crypto mining operations. Uh, and then it started ramping up, ramping up quite a bit. So uh, when Johnson & Johnson first got approved for their uh, FDA submission was actually uh, for, their, for their vaccine, um, it was actually the, the peak of uh, crypto mining operations during that time. And then when schools uh, were allowed to reopen, it's interesting, we saw another flat uh, portion of this. We're not exactly sure if it's just actors, um, you know, bored because they're not at school or not at work, so they just ramp up their mining operations uh, or what, but when things were allowed to start reopening again, sort of at the end of February, um, everything, a lot of the mining operations kind of kind of tapered off in an interesting way. Kind of a, a cool correlation there. All right. Um, let's see here. A couple other security questions. Um, what security steps can be taken to ensure my internal cloud infrastructure is not publicly exposed? And what should we do first? Um, great question. Uh, so uh, with this, we we talked, uh, both Jason talked about uh, pretty specifically the shift left principle. Um, and that shifting left is uh, typically used with things like infrastructure as code templates, whether you're using um, Kubernetes or Terraform or or something of that nature, uh, and you're you're um, using code to ex, you know create your cloud infrastructure, um, and using getting your uh, your infrastructure as code templates scanned uh, with an you know uh, a checkoff, which is uh, uh, Palo Alto's uh, Bridge Crews tool. Uh, it's called Checkoff. It's open source. Um, you can scan all of your environments, uh, all of your infrastructure as code templates, ensure that you don't have anything publicly exposed. That way you can build that directly into your CICD pipeline, be that through Jenkins or, or Circle or, or what, what have you, um, and uh, be able to stop those exposures uh, before they go out. Um, that's probably the best thing that I would say to do. Yeah, something I see that kind of goes hand in hand with that question is um, how can I apply DevSecOps or uh, secure the software development lifecycle and um, I can take on that. So uh, actually, you know, Nathaniel just touched on something pretty important, which is the infrastructure as code security. Um, you know, by shifting left, you know, the infrastructure workloads, they're all being, not always, but a lot of times being deployed uh, via codified infrastructure and policies. Um, that's, that's what really enables that automation um, that developer DevOps teams really figured out. And you know, you, you kind of incorporate security into that. Um, you know, uh, Nathaniel mentioned the checkoff tool that you know, uh, can be offered you know, through Bridge Crew. Um, you know, other key components uh, or other security controls you may want to think about uh, is identifying vulnerabilities as early as possible in the, in the software development lifecycle. Um, fact as, uh, the, aside from code, looking at container images, VM images, and even serverless functions before they're running. 
um, you should really have ways to look through uh, the container image, container repositories, look for vulnerabilities on those images. If there's vulnerabilities that are critical or um, you know, high or critical vulnerabilities, you know, be, become alerted on those things or even have uh, actionable controls that can prevent those images from being deployed inside your cloud. And be able to, like for instance, if you detect say a log4j or log4shell vulnerability, um, inside of you know one of your container images or VM images, uh, you know integrate that into your CI/CD tools to check and prevent those from being deployed. Um, and you know by the time things hit runtime or deployed in production, uh, you would have less vulnerabilities running in there. I think other ways you can uh, incorporate this. Um, you know sometimes we talk about network security or segmentation. Uh, segmentation is one of the best practices by enforcing least privilege access between. Uh, workloads, cloud infrastructure. Um, you know, a lot of the, traditionally we wait till things are running to to start writing policy. Say in dev, can I talk to prod? Uh, instead of doing that, you can also shift that left and incorporate as part of your CI/CD pipeline. Say, go ahead and write your intended network security policy, uh, and so that when applications are deployed, they come when you know network segmentation policies are already embedded. Uh, th those are just a couple ways I think of that you can incorporate DevSecOps into your security practices. Here's another question. Uh, what advice do you have to facilitate the integration of a security team with an already existing DevOps team? Um, having worked both in a security operations center and I work closely with uh, uh, DevOps, um, the biggest thing is, is to is simply establish communication. Um, make sure that that communication pathway is in there. If we can communicate with each other as teams, um, and we get a common goal associated with what it is we're trying to do. Again, going back to that digital transformation strategy, uh, if we wanna create the strategy of what security should look like and creating secure infrastructure uh, to begin with, uh, we really wanna make sure that, that the security team is not stepping on the toes of your DevOps team. Um, DevOps engineers typically like to move fast and create new systems dynamically very quickly. They like to push the boundaries of what their technology can provide and they wanna exploit that, which is great. Security teams should not get in the way of that uh, push to get new infrastructure out quickly and efficiently. What we need to do is find a smarter way, more automated way to make that security more tangible, more working with the DevOps teams together. So um, have your security team even if it's just the manager or like a lead security engineer, work with your DevOps team specifically and say, what are the CI CD tools that you're using? Are you using Jenkins? Are you using, you know, Atlassian or, you know, what, what are, how are you running these particular pieces? Um, can we integrate a security check into the beginning? Once that code is first produced, let's just do a quick scan on it. If it hits great, if it, if, it, if it's fine and everything is fine, then it keeps moving on. If there is an issue that is found, let's quickly resolve that. Number of tools like uh, Bridge Crew uh, will be able to automatically correct those tools as, or those, those issues or those findings as they come through. There's a lot of new, really insightful, awesome DevOps security engineering capabilities that are coming out um, that you just need to just plug it into the system and make sure the two teams can work together and have insight and visibility uh, into what each other are doing and for why specifically. I would add on to that. I'd say, you know, uh, review what kind of tools you have in place. Do they enable you to uh, integrate within uh, with DevOps tools like Jenkins, uh, Lassie, and so on? Um, if you don't, and maybe you need new ones, Get the DevOps teams involved in the decision making process. Let them influence your security adoption decisions. Um, you know, I've seen many cases of time where it's they're not involved at all and things just kind of fall apart because they, you know, DevOps was informed. They learned that the things really did not fit into the way that they work uh, with you know, building and deploying cloud infrastructure. Yeah, nobody likes to get told no, um, and security teams very easily. They can put that node hammer down really fast, uh, and that's a, a surefire way to just stop conversation. And that's not, that's not what we're looking for. We want uh, harmony, right? We want team cohesiveness. Uh, DevOps and security should work together. DevSecOps should be, uh, well, it may not be the best term, but still it's a really good term to use. So, Cool. 
Uh, I think that's it, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. Okay, cool. So uh, we'll wrap up. So you know, check out the the two reports that we highlighted on today. Uh, QR codes are there as well as links in the chat. I uh, want to thank you all for joining this webinar session again, and also the folks at Linux Foundation. Uh, greatly appreciate you having us on, inviting us on to come on and talk about some of the research uh, with regards to COVID-19 pandemic and how it impacted cloud expansions and cloud native security. So thanks again. Thank you so much. Have a good one. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jason and Nathaniel, for your time today. And thanks, everyone, for joining us. Just a quick reminder that this recording will be up on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. We hope you'll join us for future webinars. Thank you so much.